ladies and gentlemen, I had to answer that phone call. And I'm coming back and try to see if I can start where I left off and maybe edit this out or just make it part two. So anyway, after working for the Veterans Administration and going into these communities, you see people who go to the military, most of them are people who own hard times. They are not wealthy. Some wealthy kids go, but most of the time they're not. They go because they want to help the family out. Sometimes they go because they want to be a burden to the family and they can't find a decent job. Sometimes they go because they figure they might be able to get some educational value out of it. Sometimes they go because they want to support their child and maybe perhaps their significant other. Uh, usually it's not because of picking up a gun and killing people or being killed at. Their greatest hope is that stuff like that never happens. But then when it does, you've been committed, so you find yourself in the midst of all of that. And so these families who are left behind, for one reason or another, have need for the Veterans Administration. And as a counselor for the vets, I had to deal with them. And in that process, I learned a lot of things about how people are going through changes. Sometimes it's not necessarily them, but just going to the communities in which they live. You see all kind of crime, you see all kind of violence, and you know that's a result of people being poor. You know that's a result of a lack of prosperity. Uh, I realize that people who live in this system, even though they're prosperous, they're not satisfied because this is the kind of system we live in that promotes getting them more and getting more and getting more. And they do that as if they care about no one. And see, my friends, my relatives, and for those of you who are listening, I used to wonder after I said to myself, my people who raised me didn't raise somebody to be blind like this. And then it made me remember my beginnings. I grew up in that kind of stuff. It was in Mississippi in the country. It wasn't so violent unless it came from the white folks. But it brought something back to me and it made me remember that I had been selected. And what do I mean when I say selected? You know, most people don't believe in God. And I understand that. When you see all the crime and violence and stuff that's going around, you ask yourself, how can God allow that to happen? And if God would allow that to happen, why would you want to honor and serve a God like that? I don't blame you. Had I not known better, see, you believe, and you believe, your, all of your belief is based upon the stuff that you have received since you came into this world. And this world has had nothing to offer you but the visions and the progression of evilness, of selfishness. And even the church, when you talk to it, it solidified the system because it never asked you to change beyond uh, certain little acts, but it never taught you about love. It didn't know love. But well, I thought it did because I figured that once I realized what was going on, that one, all I had to do was come back and mention it to you. You hear me say it. Go back and speak to the church. They hear me say it. They would know because I wanted you to know. I know. I don't believe in God. I know that God is real. Why do I know God is real? Because God revealed his hand to me and eliminated all doubt. Now, I don't, I'm not trying to tell you that to get you to believe it because it's impossible for you to believe it. In fact, it's not even about you believing it. It's about me knowing that it's true. And because I know that it's true, then I know that God is in control of this world. I mean, I mean, the devil has a hand running wild, but the ultimate power is still in God's hand. And God loves me, and God loves you. But why was I touched? Well, don't be glad that, or uh, hoping sad that you did weren't touched, because being touched gives you an awesome responsibility. See, I'm alive today. Not to run around and eat good steaks, even though I can if I got them, or to ride in nice cars or dress in three-piece suits and fly here and there. That would be great. But I was saved to commit my life to you, to be an instrument of God's love to you. God is a spirit. And even though God has power beyond all imaginable power, he still gives us power. Creating this earth and the ability to do all that it does came from God. 
creating human beings with the ability to do all that he can do came from God and setting it up in such a way that each of us can play a part in things that happen here on this earth, usually dedicated toward meeting those needs that are coming amongst us, we the people, for survival, food, clothing, shelter, education, health care. And the way we do that is by exercising those, those gifts that God has planted in us. And in doing that, we would create enough of all of those things that every last human being on the face of the earth could live in splendor. And then we can go wherever our imagination leads us. That's what I've been given to tell you. You know the world you live in. You perhaps didn't know that it was under the control of the evil one. You might not have been able to understand that this is why we come from maybe having a little morality to going all the way down to having no morality at all because we're following that system. And the only one that's not following that system is the one that's standing up, not just talking about God's way, but committing his activity to God's way. Now, I have somewhat committed my activity. I ran for mayor, uh, of Minnesota, St. Paul, Minnesota, Woodbury, Minnesota. I ran for governor of the state of Minnesota. I ran for United States Senator from the state of Minnesota. And I ran for president several times because I want the world to know what I'm trying to tell you. But I didn't get enough traction to get outside, or should I say out of my driveway. But I did it. And I committed crimes to go to jail to draw you into the courtroom so I can, to that was no avail. But, I still, for 50, I, I got out of prison September 1st, 2001, right when the World Trade Center was going through that debacle. And since that time, it's been about, this is the, this is the 16th, 2016, I have not been in jail, and I just got a speeding ticket the other day. I have been sick and clean, but I've been talking. I've been on the internet, Facebook, YouTube, I've been talking. Now. I find ourselves, well, we as a people have become so immoral that the powers that be have proposed not only, but put two evil representations, one in the Republican Party, one in the Democratic Party, and say, these are your choice for president of the United States. It doesn't matter to them who you vote for. You're wondering who you're going to vote for. You're trying to figure the lesser of two evils. To them, it doesn't matter who you vote for. Because evil serves the greater evil. And whoever you put in there, their service is to the greater evil, not you the people. But you don't know that. You are filled with so much division that any little thing that seems to address you makes you think that's a better deal for you. I want you to know that that's not a better deal. God is the best deal. Your houses are falling apart. Your plumbing needs to be done. Your car is falling apart. You need a tune-up. You can't get it. Your children are getting ready to start the school, and money is tight, and you need some food in the refrigerator. All of these things exist today, and you are just hoping that Miss Clinton, the, Repo the Democrat, or Donald Trump, the Republican, is going to do something to help you. Ladies and gentlemen, they are not going to do one doggone thing to help you because it is about evil. It's about selfishness. And that's what you've been bought into. But I want you to stop thinking about that because that will not work. What I'm asking you and saying to you is that you really got to be born again. You got to have that trash flushed out of your mind. You got to start seeing people as your brothers and sisters and not you out there against the world. But that you're all out here together to meet the common needs amongst every last one of you and be friends to one another and love one another. You got to do that. But that's just a start. To get where I'm trying to take you you got to be born again. What I mean by born again, you got to see within your own being the vision of that wonderful life. You got to see it not for you but for everybody. And you got to be committed to it and you got to give service to only it and not to the system that we've been living in. And when you decide to do that, depending upon the time, you might have to start going to jail and you got to be ready for it. You got to consider that a blessing. Some of you might be killed, and you 
will be considering that a blessing. And your family should consider that a blessing. Because when you start standing up against evil, you might have a drone and drop a bomb right down in the middle of your house when you're in the bed asleep. It just might happen. You see, ladies and gentlemen, you have to realize this. You have been taught to think that you were the number one. And this is why we love sports, because it's competitive. You choose your team, and it drives you wild just to see your team win. And it drives, tears you apart to see your team lose. You see, that's mind control. That's setting you up. That's setting you up so you can be, I mean, you can be dealt this way with any matter of society. Then they tell you, after you're listening to stuff like that, they tell you that your nation is the greatest nation. They compete to see who can get the, the awards. The greatest nation. Same old, same old. Training your mind. Now you've got everybody who think that they are just as good as you. Out to prove it. And then now you say, well, that's, that's where competition is important. Competition is good. It's great. No, it's not. Because of competition, you've got this crime. But you've got this violence. You've got this poverty in as well. Because of this competition, you've got terrorism and war. All of these things happen because of this competition. And you lose because whoever's running this game has amassed all of the wealth that they could ever, ever need in worlds to come. And the only thing you've done is struggling from sun up to sundown. And you've been led to believe that you're supposed to do that by living by the, what the, what's something about the sweat of your brow or hustling from daylight to sundown just as a curse. The curse that you're involved in it's the continuing following the system. Now, my job is to tell you what I told you, one, and two, for me to stop following the dictates of the system. Now, that doesn't mean for me to just blatantly go out and resist everything that the system is about. No, it does not. It means resisting what is wrong about the system. What is wrong, because what is right is always right. And what is wrong is always wrong. And there is no way it can be right for God to own everything and give it to all of us. And a few of us got control over most of all things that exist and leave the scraps for us and now ready to wipe us off the face of the earth. Now, I used to get upset with the preachers because the preachers weren't telling you this. I thought they knew this. I really thought they did. But all of these years, 60 some odd years going to church, I've never heard anybody talk about it. Maybe they would refer to something in the Bible relative, but never about we the people having that possibility. Most of the people that I've heard talk about God in the church look at money as though God gave you money, especially since it had written on it in God we trust. But God doesn't use money. All God needed was the people to have a need. He provided in the earth, on and above it, seen or unseen, the ability to extract it through the people for the, the common purpose of utilizing it by the people. And what did it require to get it was need, want, or desire. No money at all. That's from the pit of hell. But, and you, a lot of you, a lot of you got a lot of hell in your banks in your investments. Now, having told you this, what is the solution? The solution is to do as I just indicated. Stop following the dictates of this system. In other words, if the system says do right about something, then do right. If, if, if it represents righteousness, then that's what you do. If it represents, and wh what do I mean by that? I'm saying, Prejudiceness, it has its reflections. When you see people who uh, supposedly got control over other folks' lives, but they exploit them, what is that? Better yet, what is it that says that a person, a people, or a nation can have the wherewithal to do whatever they want to do, since we're talking about money? And another person, or people, or nation, does not have that wherewithal at all. 
yet they desire the same thing that others desire. And it appears that sometimes what has happened to them uh, draws them to do the same thing. See, the reason that these people don't have what they need is because it has been taken by others. Now, others try to say they don't have because they're lazy and, and ignorant or whatever. But the truth of the matter is they took it. And so these people who now want some part of it got laws to keep them in place. But they have to find themselves violating these laws to try to just get some taste off the table. See, when you allow stuff like that to happen, you're playing a part in it. Stuff like that should never happen. So ladies and gentlemen, you have to be born again. And you have to stop following the system. And stop being afraid. Stop being ashamed. Be bold when you go up in these courtrooms charged with something vicious. Because the system has tried to deny you. Don't be able to act like you want the judge to have mercy on you. You don't want the judge to have mercy on you. You want the judge to change to agree with you. And to change this doggone situation, or to help change this doggone situation that you have to go through every day. And, and be emphatic about it. Don't be biting your lips. Now, that will happen automatically if the spirit of love is in you. If not, then you might be a little shaky. But from that little shakiness comes boldness. And uh, I think I'm going to leave it there right now. I hope that you got something out of it. I love you. No, 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 I can't go right now. Since I told you about my first wife, what she wanted, let me tell you about my second wife. All of those things that I wanted before and still want now, I promised my current wife that we would have them. We'd enjoy life, that there would be no better life that she could enjoy than a life with me. Now, the reason I told her that is because I know that the Heavenly Father has it designed to be like that. And even though when we got married, it was not like that, I was committed to see that it got like that. And it seems as though I have failed her because I counted on the people. If they didn't, underst if they didn't understand God like that, if they didn't love God like that, that they would grow to love him like that. And before I expired or she, we would experience a life that's turned around where we didn't have to worry about nothing but love being strengthened. That's all. It didn't happen that way. It didn't happen that way at all. And I guess she feels disappointed. I feel disappointed because the, we the people couldn't come together. But yet, I can't change because I know God is real, and you don't. Bye-bye.